for the deputy president one to locate his client and report back at five so that we may proceed with these proceedings senior counsel paul mwite you may now inform the house so that we proceed Mr. Speaker, uh, through you, I would like to inform Honorable Senators that I've been able to contact the doctors at Karen Hospital. There are a number of uh, doctors, a team of doctors, who are looking after the Deputy President. Because of his condition, I was not able to directly talk to him on the advice of his doctors. He said he must have complete rest for the time being. I was, however, informed by his doctors that he is currently suffering intense chest pains. I did not want to inquire uh, beyond that, much more speaker. But just in order to perhaps save the time of this honorable house, let me, as I sit down, invite uh, Mr. Speaker and the House to look at Article 145 of the Constitution, sub. Article 6. Mr. Speaker, sub Article 6 of Article 145 says if the special committee reports that the particulars of any allegation against the president, of course, it applies for the deputy president. If you go to B, have been substantiated, the Senate shall after according the president an opportunity to be heard vote on the impeachment charges Mr. speaker we are aware that this honorable senate made a decision to hear the charges in plenary so that what we are doing in these proceedings, I would suggest and submit we are proceeding under Sabbatical 6B. And under Sabbatical 6B, this House, by the Constitution, is obligated to accord the Deputy President an opportunity to be had, which is why Rule 11 of the starting orders of this House specifically provides Rule 11 where the National Assembly or the President chooses not to appear. And I would like to submit that the Deputy President has not chosen not to appear. The choice of the language chooses to appear in Studying Order Number 11 is to be read with, studying, with, with the Constitution Article uh, 145, Sub Article 6 which obligates this Honorable Senate to accord the uh, Deputy President an opportunity to be heard. So I do leave the matter in your hands, Mr. Mweshimua Speaker and Honorable uh, Senators. I would suggest Article 145 the sabbatical I've read, sabbatical 6B, doesn't have a time limit of 10 days. Give the deputy president in the interest of justice, given the weight 
of removing a deputy president from office. Give him a couple of days. I thank you. So if I get you correctly, Senior Counsel Paul Mwite, it is your application to the Senate that your client be given a couple of days. Now, a couple of days doesn't mean much. <laughs> um, that is the application. Uh, what I had in mind, I would add the word humbly requests Mueshimoa Speaker and this Honorable House, the Senate, a couple of days ahead in mind up to Tuesday. We should be able to know when the Deputy President is able uh, to come and defend himself. I thank you. Council for the National Assembly. Mr. Speaker, sir. Permit me to start by registering our greatest sympathies and empathies and from the team of the National Assembly. Of course, issues to do with health are issues that are beyond our control. Mr. Speaker, sir, that said, we also would want to be cognizant of the fact that we are dealing with a constitutional moment. We are dealing with an item whose timelines are prescribed within our constitution. Mr. Speaker, sir, contrary to what learned senior counsel, Mr. Paul Muite, would want to persuade this house to believe, the proceedings before this house have not been the subject or have not been uh, transacted pursuant to Article 145.6. Mr. Speaker, sir, on the 9th of October this year, this House did sit, did pass a resolution pursuant to the provisions of Article 145.3. Mr. Speaker, sir, pursuant to that resolution, there was a Gazette notice which very clearly indicates that this house was not going to determine that uh, the matter at hand uh, from a committee perspective, but that the whole house would then be determining the matter. It then follows, Mr. Speaker, sir, that the provisions of Article 145.6 would not be applicable. Mr. Speaker, sir, in the same Gazette notice, you did Gazette the, seven, the 16th and 17th of October to be the days assigned for the hearing and determination of the motion that is before you. That said, Mr. Speaker, sir, we appreciate the place of fair hearing and an opportunity to be accorded the chance and the facilities to be able to defend one's self in a motion such as this. Mr. Speaker, I would want to add that the opportunity to be heard does not have to be oral. The rules of this House permit that parties appearing could elect to be represented, they could elect to come in person, they could file documents. Mr. Speaker, sir, the, uh, His Excellency the Deputy President has participated robustly in the proceedings both before the National Assembly where they filed a very, very detailed uh, replying affidavit and a response. Mr. Speaker, sir, if my memory serves me right, let me just make a quick reference. Before the National Assembly, His Excellency the President did file a response dated the 8th of October 2024. When the proceedings before this House began, His Excellency the President, uh, the Deputy President again filed a very robust response dated the 12th of October 2024. Mr. Speaker, sir, up to this point in time, His Excellency the Deputy President, together with his team, have had 
a beautiful opportunity to present their case. They have had an opportunity to cross-examine in great detail all the, uh, the witnesses that we presented before this House. If anything, Mr. Speaker, sir, if any prejudice were to be occasioned in the course of this, uh, I mean, here in this matter, that prejudice would be on us because our expectation would be that His, ex His Excellency the President would be able to attend and avail an opportunity for the National Assembly to cross-examine him. Mr. Speaker, sir, taking into account the circumstances that we find ourselves in, having also very keenly heard a uh, learned senior counsel speak, matters health are not matters to be taken lightly. On the same tone, Mr. Speaker, sir, matters health cannot be given timelines. There cannot be certainty that if an adjournment were to be given even for one week, then there is clarity and certainty that we'll be able to proceed on that assigned day. Mr. Speaker, sir, we would urge that we borrow practice that has accorded to other similar organs created by the Constitution. I have the courts of law in mind. Mr. Speaker, sir, because an earlier on submitted that Article 50 provides for, an opportunity, I mean, uh, uh, provides for the right to fair hearing and that that fair hearing does not necessarily have to be oral, we have had practice in our Supreme Court. We are dealing with some of the most important decisions of our lifetimes, including decisions arising from presidential elections have, in all the uh, elections that we have had, had parties file submissions and their documents, and that their advocates have had an opportunity to appear before the courts to highlight those uh, uh, documents and pleadings that have been filed. In this occasion, because His Excellency, the Deputy President, has had an opportunity to present all the material that he ought to or he wanted to present, and also had the opportunity to cross-examine all the witnesses that he wanted to cross-examine, all that is left on their side is highlighting. On our part, Mr. Speaker, sir, the part of the National Assembly, so that then we are able to give progress to this matter, we are willing to take the painful decision to forego the cross-examination of His Excellency the Deputy President and only proceed with highlighting submissions in relation to the documents that we have filed before this House. It is our humble view that no prejudice would have been occasioned to His Excellency the Deputy President. Mr. Speaker, sir, we urge that that, uh, if I had my learned senior colleague, Mr. Paul Mwita, senior counsel, well, he seemed to have been imploring this House to consider adjourning. Mr. Speaker, sir, let me end by drawing the attention of this court to Rule 12 of the proceedings, uh, the rules governing the proceedings currently underway. Mr. Speaker, sir, Rule 12 of those rules dictates that once the hearing has commenced, it shall proceed up to the end. It does not provide for an option for the House to adjourn. If that is the dictate, Mr. Speaker, sir, of the, rule, uh, the rules governing the proceedings before this House, we urge that being a country, being an organ of a constitution that is... Uh, uh, that, that, that is controlled by the rule of law and the constitution, you, di you direct that we proceed with the hearing as had been planned. I am most obliged. Mr. Speaker, sir, just before uh, I leave again, maybe I would uh, want to invite uh, my leader, Mr. Uh, uh, Honorable James Orengo, Senior Counsel, to also just add one word before you give your directions. I am most obliged. Uh, Mr. Speaker, just briefly, in these proceedings, we are governed by Article 145, and there is a very unique provision in Article 145 that you don't find 
in legislations uh, to do with even litigation in the courts. But because the makers of this constitution knew that uh, these proceedings are time bound, there is under Article 145, sub Article 5, a very important provision. And I think that article is not there for cosmetic value. That article is there to deal with a situation like we find ourselves in because the makers of this constitution knew that when, prov uh, when processes are time bound, they must be accepted verb. Article 145, sub article 5, which applies mutatis mutandis in relation to the removal from office by way of impeachment of the deputy president states as follows. The president, and for that matter, it should be read the deputy president, shall they have the right to appear and be represented before the uh, special committee during its investigation. Now the point that I want to make that not in a lot of legislation you find the right to be represented highlighted because the deputy president can elect to be represented either by his advocate or by him appearing in person or having both the, pre the deputy president and his advocate to appear. Now, I want to put before the Senate, because a lot of you have this problem a lot of time during the elections. If in accordance with the election law, you are required to, 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 to subscribe your nomination papers on a certain day and you fail it. You're running for president or deputy president and you're told that you must present your nomination papers on a certain day as it is there in the law. Would you feign sickness and fail to represent your nomination papers on that particular day? And I can tell you if you fail to do so, the law will not give you any accommodation. It, you'll be out, and there are a lot of decisions on this matter. I want to talk to this Senate very frankly. That uh, Senior Council Mite was basically giving evidence. He has not told us well, or if he has told us, uh, the medical is institution where the deputy president is. But for the deputy president to fail to bring evidence, credible evidence before the house that has been admitted, even that evidence that has been admitted to a medical institution, we don't have it. We will rely on the evidence from my senior Senior Counsel Paul Mwite. That is evidence. But in practice, I can say without a fear of contradiction, there are many times where people have represented even medical documents and later on they've been found to be uh, fake, if I may use that word. I think the thing that the Deputy President should have done, we should have had one of the doctors here at least to tell us about his admission and about his condition because up to 1.15 the deputy president was here. He was not evacuated from here in an ambulance. And if I can give evidence from the bar, he went to his office and again there's no evidence that he was evacuated in an ambulance. He went to current hospital in himself to check at the hospital. So I think our constitutional duty is to live by what the constitution requires of us. The greatest prejudice, for me, I was looking forward
to cross-examine the deputy president. But unfortunately, the story that has been told does not include cross-examination of the evidence of the deputy president, which is on record. But because we are time-bound, and as my London friend Eric Gumba said, we are prepared to go by the evidence in record. The prejudice is to us. The sickness of the deputy president is affecting us more because we would want to cross-examine him. But he's have, he has evidence in record which we cannot test by the way of cross-examination. And there's no assurance that on Tuesday the deputy president would be here. Finally, we can also say from, the, from, from here that there are many cases that have been filed all over, including in Malindi today. That has to do with the proceedings that are going on here. So I am in a position to say that this health condition in which the deputy president is, and I sympathize, may be opportunistic in the absence of medical evidence from a doctor. It may be opportunistic. And I saw him when he came in. I'm not a doctor, but there was nothing to suggest that he, he was in the condition that Honorable Counsel has been talking about. So do the senators now turn into a jury to make a decision on the basis of evidence presented from the bar by senior counsel without no documentary proof of where the deputy president is and what elements is suffering for. I think the more important duty for this Senate is to comply with the Constitution. And we urge you to com comply with the Constitution and proceed with the hearing of this impeachment proceedings. So thank you. Senior Counsel for Mwete. Mwashima Speaker, Honorable Senators, we all live in Kenya, and I would like to make this submission. These gadgets we have here capture every word uttered accurately. So that if I was found tomorrow to have lied to these senators, sanctions can be brought on me. And I would have thought that that fear of telling a lie to this honorable Senate to me is more powerful than even bringing a medical report. We've had many medical reports generated outside hospitals. We see them in courts almost on daily basis. Mr. Speaker, you will remember the rush that was there when I was asking to be given up to 5 p.m. And it was a rush. <coughs> was I to fail to come back to this noble house at 5 p.m. waiting for a medical report when the doctors there are busy attending to their patient? the Deputy President. Medical reports I can bring. If I've told lies, that is something that can be established. And my learned friend, Mwishimua Honorable Orengo, talks about giving evidence from the bar. When I was learning, they are seated down when he's giving evidence from the bar about some cases filed in Malindi that I'm not aware of. Perhaps he should have given us 
a copy of that. Mushiwa Speaker, Article 145, sub Article 6 is clear, and I do not want to take time of this August House Senate. Going back to it, it applies, and I would plead with you and with honorable senators to give us until Tuesday to see whether the deputy president will be well enough. No one, no one decides when to get sick and when not to get sick. I am sure many honorable senators here will have a story of their shock because of having spent an evening with somebody, then the following day they hear that the person is gone. Yet that person was looking good and healthy. Let's be humane. Let's be compassionate. To an autu kidogo. Tuesday, the heavens are not falling down to join with the earth. I thank you much, more, more Speaker. Senior Council, uh, Paul Mwite. There is a, a hypothetical uh, question that was raised by um, Senior Council Orengo. Assuming, and it's just an assumption, assuming the Senate is inclined 